Thanks to NordVPN for sponsoring TLDR. It's been quite some time since the global financial crisis. In fact, it's been more than 14 years by this point. So you'd think that the aftermath of it would be long resolved, right? Well, kind of. For one country in particular, though, it's taken more time than ever to recover. We are, of course, talking about Greece, a country whose GDP is, by one measure at least, still a staggering 25% down from its pre-crisis peak. So in this video, we're going to be taking a look at why Greece's recovery has been so slow, whether it's likely to continue at the current pace, and what this shows us more generally about European politics. First things first though, some background. When the global financial crisis first hit back in 2008, a lot of countries panicked. The economic powerhouse that was the United States was in turmoil, with the likes of the Lehman Brothers collapsing, and other major institutions were also on the brink of collapse. The initially US-focused panic began to spread from there, first to the UK, and then to the rest of Europe. Northern Rock, a lender in the UK, experienced a bank run, and the Royal Bank of Scotland, then the biggest bank in the world by assets, required a major taxpayer intervention. The problem was, though, that the gradual domino collapse of banks created what was termed a sovereign bank nexus. In essence, when the banks collapsed, or got close to collapsing, they needed huge cash injections from the government, i.e. a bailout. And that bailout required the government to borrow money, in effect transferring the private debt of the bank into public debt. So, as we saw bank after bank collapse, we also experienced an increase in public debt levels in many European member states, many of whom already had a problem with this. What made it worse was that most banks already held government debt in the form of bonds as a safe, liquid asset. Now, banks are required to keep enough liquid assets to cover the immediate claims they might receive. But for a time, government bonds were seen as relatively safe liquid assets because they were, if push came to shove, backed by a country's treasury and, by extension, the taxpayer. Right? Well, not as much as it first seemed. When government debt ballooned, concerns started to be raised about whether government debt was actually serviceable, which reduced the value of the government bonds held by banks, plunging them into trouble and requiring yet more taxpayer intervention, which worsened the debt levels and caused the spiral to continue. The problem in Greece, though, was that they were already in a delicate position. Back in 2004, Greece admitted to having repeatedly misrepresented significant economic data before it joined the euro. And as such, Greece's government debt in 2000 was revised up from 102% to 114% of GDP, nearly double the limit set by the Stability and Growth Pact, the main rulebook for government debt and deficits. But it didn't end there, and Greece continued to play with its numbers. In January 2010, Eurostat, the EU statistical agency, found severe irregularities in Greek economic data, revising the Greek deficit in 2009 from 3.7% to an astounding 12.7%. And by April, Eurostat had revised their own figure up again to 13.6% and expressed grave doubt over all of the figures being put out by the country. The sheer extent of these issues forced the European Commission, European Central Bank, and International Monetary Fund to bail out the country on several occasions, resulting in some quite severe austerity measures. But that was more than a decade ago, which poses the question as to why these reforms didn't work, and why Greece is still doing so poorly, all things considered. Well, according to the data from the International Monetary Fund, Greek GDP per capita stood at just shy of 32,000 US dollars at current prices in 2008, before crashing to 18,000 in 2015. And by 2027, it's only expected to reach $26,500. 
2018 saw Greece successfully exiting its third and final bailout program, with bond yields relaxing in 2019. So why is it that it took so long? And why is it that things are still so bad? For some, the answer is as simple as Greece not properly coming through with some of the required reforms. For others, the answer is not that the economy remains weak in spite of austerity measures, but because of them. Now, economists have a concept called hysteresis. And while we don't have time to turn this video into an economics course, the TLDR of hysteresis is that when an economy has experienced a negative shock for a while, it becomes, in effect, baked in. While the country did indeed leave the EU's bailout program back in 2018, it didn't exactly leave as a rocketing success of economic recovery. The country left with a huge debt burden and significant levels of corporate taxation. Now, following the exit of Greece from the bailout program, the European Commission's Directorate General for Economic and Financial Affairs published its Enhanced Surveillance Report on Greece, basically looking into just how the Greek economy was going post-bailout. And the report found that while the labour market was improving, it was still in a poor position. Unemployment in November 2018 stood at a significant 18.5% and youth unemployment stood at 39.1%. That so many people remained unemployed for that long is in effect textbook hysteresis, the concept that we mentioned earlier. Added to that, a significant number of workers ended up leaving the country during the aftermath of the crisis, leading to a concept known as brain drain. Highly educated individuals with skills sought elsewhere in the EU and beyond just up sticks and left, establishing a life for themselves in a different country. The Centre for European Reform estimates that roughly 6% of Greece's entire labour force left the country for work or education. That's 6% of the workforce, well, no longer able to work. Then comes the issue that prolonged the crisis in the first place, bad debt. Following the financial crisis, Greek banks were supported by the state and survived, but only barely. A lot of banks have significant amounts of non-performing loans, more commonly known as just bad debt. Greek banks before the pandemic had a staggering 65 billion in bad debt, i.e. loans that were in default or otherwise overdue in their interest payments. And that 65 billion accounts for roughly 40% of the entire debt balance sheet. In turn, this bad debt acts as a drag on the bank, constraining their lending capabilities, meaning that they couldn't support a full recovery, even if they wanted to. Regardless, Greece is seeing a significant rebound from the effects of the pandemic, with the economy gaining substantial momentum at the moment, namely due to a lot of money coming in from the EU to support their post-pandemic recovery. Greece is also said to get a substantial sum of money through the EU's structural and cohesion funds, which comes on top of Greece's next allocation from Next Generation EU, the EU's post-pandemic recovery fund. All of this together will accelerate the Greek economy, but it's still way too early to determine whether the Greek economy will return to its pre-crisis cruising speed ever again. That being said, the Greek economy is being buoyed right now by high levels of tourism. But when you visit, you might find another issue beyond just the economic crisis. The sites and services that you rely on might not work as expected. And that's where a VPN comes in. NordVPN is far more than just a VPN which allows you to encrypt your web traffic. It's a full suite of tools to secure your digital life, from blocking malware and preventing malicious ad trackers to helping you set more secure passwords. And there's fun stuff too, because using NordVPN, you can access the internet through other countries, which means that region-locked content is available to you from anywhere. And as they have over 5,400 servers in 59 different countries, there's a lot of choice. So when you're at home, you can stream movies and films that aren't on your streaming services. And when you're away, you can still log in via your country, preventing all of your apps from freaking out and thinking that you're being hacked. 
So NordVPN really is an all-in-one security solution. And with the fastest connection of any VPN out there, now's the time to get yourself protected. So if you sign up for a two year subscription using our link, you'll not only get a massive discount, but you'll also benefit from their 30 day free trial to give you some peace of mind while you find out how much you love it. Anyway, thanks for your support and thanks to NordVPN for sponsoring TLDR.